90% of the token supply to the community. So Opalus held on to 10%. Uh, there's a 15 year curve. The first four were retro. We did the, the drop in 2020, 2021, and then 11 years. Um, and so Opalus spun ETH Denver back to the community via this vehicle, SportDAO. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was uh, different corporate structures, and what we used was uh, Colorado LCA, a Limited Cooperative Association. I think of cooperatives as essentially being DAOs with a legal wrapper, which we can get into if any of you guys are interested in that. If not, we can just gloss over it and I'll move on. Um, Opalus is also set up this way. There are a couple restrictions when you do tokens with cooperatives. One is it's like you can't sell the token and you can't incentivize buying the token, which is why you probably have never heard of work and you've probably never heard of Spork because we didn't play any of those speculative bullshit games. Wait, can I swear? Is yes. that, yeah? It's, yes. a, it's a 21 plus <laughs> Twitch audience. <laughs> There's just a lot of kids in the audience. So. They're, they see crypto Twitter, so it's way worse. Not all of them. <laughs> Ooh, what's PG going on? I'm oh, sorry, keep PG-13, that's all. PG-13? Yeah. So I get one F word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did I already waste it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. It is what it is. So you've never heard of work or sport, probably, because we never played these liquidity mining games that were like incentivizing DGENs to come speculate on it and then dump the token. The people who have these tokens either earn them or actually want them. And so that's where you, you, you arrive at um, better incentivized games, which is what we're trying to go for. We're trying to build positive sum economic games. Okay, so let's let's get into Opolis. What is it? And well, I'll do the shilly part like real quick, and then we can just move on. Because I don't, I don't recognize a lot of you, so it's possible that you just don't even know what it is. Raise your hand if you've heard of Opolis before. How many of you are members? Any members? Oh. Hey. <laughs> are you you're a member? Yeah, kind of? Yeah. <laughs> Two? Okay, a lot of growth opportunity in this room. <laughs> Woo! So, <laughs> Obelis is a member owned digital employment cooperative. Are you familiar with payroll companies? <laughs> ADP, Paychex, Trinet. If you have a W 2 job, I'm sure they're the assholes who sign your checks, right? <laughs> yeah. Poor you log into. Your company, the company you work for, owns your entire benefits administration, right? Um, have any of you like wanted to quit your job but you didn't because you get health benefits through your company? Any? Yes. Yeah. That's a few. Not as many. Are you guys just all really happy in your jobs, or you just already <laughs> live that Web three life? <laughs> <laughs> who who works full time in Web three? One, two, three, four, five, six. I lost my health insurance. <laughs> and you lost your health insurance? Well, yeah, I mean, the project doesn't happen, so you buy it yourself, right? But essentially, yeah. I did what you said. Like, I had a full time job, traditional finance, fantastic benefits. I was like, oh, let's go do Web3. What do you do Web3 now? Uh, front end for a, a, a DeFi platform. Cool. Front end for a DeFi platform. And the DeFi platform calls itself a DAO, probably? Uh, we have a foundation, yes. A foundation? Yeah. Okay. Um, probably not. Is it the foundation in the US or offshore? Uh, offshore Foundation and then like our ejective labs in New York. Okay, cool. Are you a W2 employee of the New York lab? Yes, if it is a contract. Yeah. Ah, got it. Okay. So this yeah. To bring this back full circle, the reasons I ask these questions is because when you work for a, an entity that's not a US based entity, that company, let's say it's a Swish Foundation or a Bahamas company. <laughs> <laughs> How is it too soon? It was like a week ago. That's like a decade in crypto. <laughs> when you work for an entity that is not based in the US, they have to spin up a US subsidiary because Americans can't work for foreign entities. You have to work for an American company. W-2 payroll, health benefits, paying into all the different tax accounts that you need to pay into. That's why I was asking, because those are kind of important, like, qualifying <laughs> questions. Also, I was curious, and I wanted to dox them to all of you guys. <laughs> um, okay, so these big payroll companies, they're designed for employments of 50 or, 50 or more. So if you've got 50 or more employees at your company, you're, you're able to get really good benefits because they're able to negotiate at a group rate. And these companies are taking 
somewhere between 17 and 40 percent, and they're just like cutting your company's bottom line significantly. It's a huge overhead cost. Then this new brand of like Silicon Valley startups come along, like the Gusto and JustWorks, and they're like, we're going to focus on startups that do like five and ten employees. But under ten employees, they're not really making money. They're kind of taking a, a loss lead to try to, to handle that. But nobody focuses on the individual. This was like the 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 thing that, that John Powell came up with. Um, to not do the PEO thing, but do the DEO thing, a decentralized employer organization, and focus on the employment of one. And you're thinking, all right, well, if it doesn't make money, why would you do it? The point is not to make money. The point is to maximize benefits and minimize costs to its members. Are, are any of you familiar with REI? That's an outdoor oh, sports yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, their structure is a cooperative, and when you go to check out, they offer you to become a member of the co-op. It costs like twenty or thirty dollars, and then at the end of the year, you get a dividend check for your pro rata amount of the profits that REI had. Because their goal is not to maximize profits to shareholders; it's to provide a dividend to its members, who are its customers and its employees. And that's that's how we modeled it. This is how Opus is, is set up, the, the employment commons, and this is how Sporkout is set up to try to maximize benefits and minimize costs. Do you have a question? Is that like the credit unions or the banks? Is the subscription together they don't? It would be more? similar, yeah. If you're talking about a bank, it would be as a credit union is to a bank. So a uh, co op is to a C Corp as a credit union is to a bank? Kind of, yeah, sure. Um, where were we? <laughs> REI, oh, yeah, co-op, co membership, ah, dividends. <laughs> dividends, yeah. Um, that's another one. So like you can't, this is, this is like the regulatory issue with, with crypto and DeFi is that like there's all these great economic games that have been created and they either have to offshore and do these things abroad to avoid SEC regulations, or they have to choose to not directly give value to the people who hold the token, because then you're selling these unregistered securities. Right? Are you guys all familiar with this? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sadly. Someone has felt the pain points of this <laughs> severely. Um, and so that's one of the, the cool things about cooperatives is that you can actually give a cash dividend to your members with the stipulations of like, don't sell the token, don't incentivize buying. And by not playing into this speculative garbage game, you're actually able to drive value to real customers, members, yeah. Uh, when, when you say don't incentivize buying, like giving a dividend, is, could that be kind of considered like incentivizing, incentivizing to buy? Or what, no. like, what constitutes incentivizing? Incentivized buying is like liquidity mining. So it's like saying, we're gonna give a distribution of, like we're gonna take 20% of the supply, we're gonna put it into a farm, and then you go buy it and stake it in that farm, and, and that's, that's just playing speculative games, specifically for the purpose of making more money on the money. Whereas the people who are receiving the work token, uh, you have to be a member of the co-op, you have to run your payroll through the cooperative, or you have to refer somebody to the cooperative, or you can stake it to earn more. But all of those things are only open to people who are members. So somebody off the street could go and they could theoretically speculate on, on the token, but they're not gonna earn any of that economic value because you actually have to be a member. The other cool thing is Opelos did raise money from investors, but the voting weight, all of it, 100% of the voting power, remains with the employee members, people who run their payroll through the co-op. So we've made sure that the loop is, is full, it's a full circle on making sure that the incentives are aligned around maximizing benefits and minimizing costs. And so there's no value um, extractor that's just taking money out of this economy. Is, yeah. Is, is there a, um, a governance component to uh, sport and work? This is a great question. So the question was, is there a governance component, <coughs> governance component to, I'll start, I'll start with work. So, um, the, the bylaws of the Employment Commons say that the work token becomes the uh, governance tool or the governance method when the Commons reaches 1,000 members. So right now we're in the 500 range. Uh, by January 1st, it's entirely possible that we get over that 1,000 and then the work token becomes the primary governance component. Um, 
Spork does not have bylaws like this. So it will be up to people who are participating to try to figure out what that governance is going to end up looking like. We're still pretty early. Um, we have another 10 years of distribution. You know the best way to earn a spork? Going to eat Denver. <laughs> That's one, yeah, but you have to do something at eat Denver. So yeah, going to eat Denver, you get a base. Run payroll through your office. Buy merch. <laughs> buy, so buying merch was uh, four spork per dollar. It's going down to three spork per dollar. I think all the attendees last year, or this year is like 52.8 spork. There's a better way. Not running payroll. Or be a member? Uh, of of Spork Down. Oh. These are important questions, not just for the, but. <laughs> because you guys are probably going to at some point have this conversation with how do we structure SD and how does it grow and how should we incentivize things correctly? Volunteer. Volunteers earned 5280. I'm the treasurer of Sporked Out. This is why I have these numbers all the time. <laughs> I'm not like a uh, what, you contribute? Yeah. Um, stewards, I think, if you were a full-time steward, I think it was like 50, 52,800. And what, what do stewards do? Oh, many different things. So we've got like art stewards, we have operations stewards, uh, education, scholarship, like literally everything that goes into running an event. Um, uh, Biddle Week has its own entire set of stewards, uh, sponsorship, uh, I did merch and treasury. <laughs> there are a lot of different things that go into making an event. Hackathon. Speaker. Yeah, speakers. Um, I actually haven't figured out the speaker number for last year. That's one of the last things I have to calculate before the before January first. Um, biddling. Do you guys know this word? Biddle. Yeah. It's a misspelling of the word build, like oh, odor. Oh, okay. Except for it was coined at East Denver in I think 2018 or 2019. The birthplace of biddle. This is what we call it. Um, <clears throat> it's a better meme than hodl. Because hodlers got wrecked. <laughs> but fiddlers keep building. Um, yeah, no, submitting a project and then uh, winning the either in the quadratic voting or winning the hackathon. Um, oh, here's another fun component. So this year we launched uh, Buffcorn Ventures, which is a venture wing to support projects that come out of Eat Denver. So Eat Denver is uh, one of the best places for it to be your first event. It, we, we, we take pride in, in onboarding new people to the ecosystem and training them into like learning best practices the right way instead of like NFT flipping. And it's like not your keys, not your coins. Like the, the important lessons of coming into crypto in a safe environment and not just getting dumped on by influencers. And <laughs> I'm trying to think of what the where that was going. <laughs> what was the thing? What is the first uh, event? First event. How do you get more? Youth Denver is the first yeah. event for builders. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Buffalo Ventures. <laughs> it's been a long day. I started, I started today in a different city than this one. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's how our plans work. So, uh, <laughs> so Buffalo Ventures. Uh, a lot of a lot of like students will come, the Web2 devs will come to eat them, they'll, they'll hack in the hackathon, and then they'll win like 10, 20, $30,000 worth of bounties, but it's not enough to quit your job, right? So you take this great project that wins, and it just gets shelved, because they still own the IP, but then they go back to their job. And so there's only three big projects that have ever come out of eat Denver. Does anybody know what they are? Oh, wow, that's a good one. That's my favorite. One inch. Tell the other two. Yeah, one inch. That's number two. Oh. I know, right? And number three. This one you might not get. Pool together. Pool together. Ah, you know your stuff. <laughs> so yeah, so there's only three really big companies, teams that have ever come out of Denver. Like, why is that? Like, it's people consider it to be the Super Bowl of crypto events. John does. I think it's more like Wimbledon. He's every, every, every is playing on grass. 
See, this is how I just see if you guys are paying attention. <laughs> Lost my train of thought again. <laughs> this guy. Too much for um, Yeah, grass. Where were we? Three companies. Only three companies. <laughs> this is a bit. I know exactly where I am. Okay, so only three companies have ever come out of Denver, and we're trying to figure out why that is. And it's because they're not getting funding. And so we, we, we stood up this venture wing that was funded mostly by the community. Uh, a bunch of L2s, um, you, you can go through, I don't want to like name names right now, because um, I'll forget one, and then the other ones will be upset that I forgot. <laughs> so a, a bunch of the ecosystem, a lot of sponsors like, came together, put this fund together, and then we invested, I think we have eight portfolio companies that we invested in in the last few months. And we're gonna start to see, like One Inches was before June, worth like over a billion dollars. Eat Denver saw none of that. None of that money goes back to, the, to Eat Denver, to, to making sure that Eat Denver is free forever, right? And that's not a complaint. Like I'm not saying, hey, one inch, like they sponsor every year. Like they're, they're a good steward of like making sure that the event stays free. Um, but like one or 2% of that one billion would be a nice chunk for the community to have, right? And so we put this venture wing uh, there's a mix of like dollars and spork and the, the there's a cap on what the investors will actually get a return on. It's 2x. And all the rest of that value will be a dividend that goes to the spork holders in whoever state. So that's an interesting dynamic that I think could be a part of how ETHSD grows, especially since you have this really cool space that you could use for, for co-working and incubating teams. You dropped me too much alpha, Josh. <laughs> really? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Probably nothing. <laughs> Probably nothing. <laughs> Probably something. <laughs> They're gonna learn about it on the podcast we just did earlier, right? Okay. Uh, Buffcorn Ventures. Any questions about Buffcorn Ventures? What is it? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a how much is it in the fund? It's a venture DAO. How much is in the fund? Ah, good question. Um, I think we raised like one point seven five, almost two million. We're gonna try to do that again and do another round, uh, and it'll be up to late February, and then do it all again, and see if we can take the the teams that win the hackathon, fund them, and you know build some unicorns. <clears throat> Is it only for Denver hackathon winners, or? I think we actually, I think two of the portfolio companies were not related to Eat Denver. Some of the qualifications for it was like, first money in, hackathon related, and hashtag chill Colorado. Mm -hmm. What was your question? Um, what's the like uh, investment criteria that Buffett Coin Ventures uses to determine where to place capital and like, uh, since it's a DAO, um, like, how does the voting process work? Yeah, so it's actually in a Moloch DAO. Do any of you guys not know what a Moloch DAO is? Okay, so a Moloch DAO is a framework code that is a type of DAO that allows, the, the key difference from Moloch DAOs from other different DAO infrastructures is the rage quit function, which makes it so that if you, all right, so let's say, all of us put 20 bucks into a DAO, right? If you're not using a rage quit function, theoretically I could write a I could make a proposal to take a thousand dollars out. And if, if I take that thousand and it gets it voted yes, there's no recourse that the, the minority voters have to protect their funds. But with rage quit, there's a grace period after a vote ends to allow you to rage quit your funds. And so your pro rata amount of the money that's in the DAO can't be taken from you. That's one of the cool functions of the Moloch DAO. So the LPs in this fund theoretically could rage quit their investment. Um, and right now it wouldn't be a great time to because all of the money is out. So they'd be rage quitting with less. Uh, but a, a new a new a new DAO will be spun up for the for the new fund. 
Is it like strictly all crypto, or is it like a traditional money? I think we had two investors who sent cash, and then I think we turned it into USDC. And so it's all being handled. Gave the shares on chain. It's all being handled. Yeah, it's all in the mall account. Mollocks are fun. If you're not in a Moloch, you should join a Moloch. V3? Yeah, Moloch V3. That's a great Moloch. M-O-L-O-C-H. So a little bit of background on Moloch. Moloch is um, a demon who eats babies. Oh. Sacrifices babies. I don't know, it depends on the scripture you're doing. The meme comes from Amin Soleimani. This is like 2019. And they created this, uh, this framework that has this rage quit and rage kick function. Um, but the idea, and if you I highly recommend, right, like required reading, you're gonna get home. You're gonna get a quiz on this, okay? I'm giving you one more. Meditations on Malik. It's a, it'll take you, I don't know, an hour, maybe an hour and a half to read, right? Meditations on Malik, it's a great piece. Um, it explains a lot of the meme and so, uh, Malik is the god of chaos, disorganization. And all of what we're doing here in DAOs is coordination games, right? And a lot of it can actually feel like games, like we're doing coordination for the sake of figuring out how to do coordination, for the sake of figuring out how to do coordination. And that's intentional, because what we're doing right now is experimenting on the governance frameworks that are going to be how the entire economy works, and like we kind of have to get it right, and we need to kick the tires, and we need to get it wrong, and we need to get it wrong a few times, a few different ways, so that we can learn what works and what doesn't work. What I mean by that is, um, all right. So, are you guys like read like Karl Marx? <laughs> Everyone's like, I don't want to be out of this as a socialist. <laughs> Everyone went through high school. You've read Karl Marx, okay? It's okay to do it. Yeah. Okay. So like, you know, like the like um, seizing the the means of production, empowering workers. Right? I think a lot of socialists, where they get it wrong is they think that the government is going to take money from rich people and from companies to give to the masses, right? What it, I think what we have the ability to do with this technology is to use blockchain technology and it's, it's transparency and everything is on chain and actually being able to have employees and customers and other stakeholders all be able to interact and own a company. Yeah, you, you feel me? You, 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 um, yeah, yeah, it is. Like we're like companies are restructured. Like DAOs, you work for a DAO, you're an owner of the company. Whereas like traditional structure, you have to like hope that the founders are going to give you 0.25 or whatever, a little bit of equity, uh, RSUs, and hope they invest in cliffs and all this bullshit. It's like no, you join a DAO, you have shares in a DAO. You buy the token, you own the token, right? It's not, you get token grants. And, all right, so here's, here's where this connects to like, could you imagine if an airline, instead of giving you miles or loyalty points or whatever, gave you equity in the airline for flying it? Yeah, it would be cool. We're like really close, we're like five to 10 years away from all companies being designed like this. And we think this like, there's this like steep cliff of, oh man, that's so far away. But it already exists. REI, Ocean Spray. There's a bunch of cooperatives that are really successful and use these models. Nobody's gonna say, oh, REI is socialist, we can't do that. It's these, like, there's so much, like, power and, and negativity and connotations inside the words capitalism and socialism and communism that, like, people aren't thinking about this technology makes all of that old world stuff relatively irrelevant because we can just do I don't have a better word for it, but if you do, like stakeholder capitalism. If you got a better word, that'd be great. Because it still uses the word capitalist that puts a bunch of people off. <laughs> Any questions <laughs> on that? It's heavy stuff. Let's go back to boring. <laughs> okay. How many of you are 1099 contractors? Or what? 1099. Oh. You all W-2s? Wow. Some people are just shy. <laughs> just shy. Okay. Um, how many of you are self-employed? 
There's a lot of crossover between self-employed and W-2. So you W-2 yourself? Yes. <laughs> yeah. LLC K-1. LLC K-1. That's, a, that's another way to do it. Sold out by a staffing agency. Sold out by a staffing agency. <laughs> that's annoying. They're taking a big cut. Not at the moment. <laughs> All right, cool. So just real briefly, I would like to describe the flow of money and how it works to be an Opolis member, because I think that would be interesting. It's yeah. kind of a joke. It's very <laughs> I talk about it all the time. It's not interesting at all. But it is important infrastructure for like the future of humanity. So like, bear with me for a second. Um, what we do is we take independent workers, freelancers, anybody who's self-employed, we help them wrap themselves in their own employment vehicle, usually an LLC that elects S Corp. If this sounds difficult, we make it very easy. It costs $300. Um, if, if you're joining before January 1st, we waive that. So we'll, we'll pay for your, your employment vehicle. Your employment vehicle invoices all the different clients that you have the same way you normally would, but instead of that money going to you on your social security number, which is a little bit riskier, it's going into your LLC on the EIN. And then what we do is we invoice the employment vehicle for whatever you tell us you want your paycheck to be. We take that money and pay the taxes that you owe, state, local, federal taxes, social security, Medicare, workers' compensation, uh, if you've opted into a 401k or um, HSA, FSA, any of the stuff that you want the money diverted to, we'll, we'll distribute that for you. And then the remainder gets direct deposited into your personal bank account on the first and third Friday of the month. So a couple of really cool things that are in there. One, you get group rate health insurance because we have 500 something employees, right? And if you're self-employed, you're an employment of one, maybe you've got two or three employees, but you're not gonna be able to negotiate at the levels that we are. It's kind of like a union in that sense. The larger we grow, the more buying power we have. It's like buying your meat at Costco instead of at whatever your local grocery store is here. Albertsons? <laughs> Safeway? Bonds. Rouse? Looks like Rouse. <laughs> okay, yeah, it's buying your meat at Costco instead of a Rouse. You guys have Costco here, right? Yeah. Oh, thank God. It's like the wilderness. I'm flying over the desert to get here. Um, the water's really close, though. Um, oh, temperate desert? Okay. Between the desert and the salt sea. Okay. Um, where were we? Help me out. Costco. Costco. Yeah, so one of the cool things is you're getting group rate buying power for health insurance, dental vision. The second one is proof of employment. So you're self-employed, you want to buy a house, you go to a mortgage broker, and they say, all right, give me two years of stable income over X amount of money, and you're like, I don't have that, I'm self-employed, I don't keep records like that. <laughs> Even if you do have the records, it's probably not consistent income, you'd be like, all right, I made 5K this month, 10K, and then 7K, and then whatever. And I'm like, okay, you're a risky, you're a risky borrower. Okay, one paycheck from the Opolis Employment Commons. One, just one paycheck and you hand that to a mortgage underwriter and they go, all right, you're a W-2 employee, this is how much money you make. Wow. And they'll give you a mortgage. Wow. I know, right? It's like 20, of all, that was the applause line. <laughs> so, 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 do you guys all own your houses or not be able to own them? It's a bunch of millennials, I can tell. Okay. Um, any questions about that? Yes. How does Opelous make money? This is a good question. This is a very good question. I touched on it a little bit earlier about the point of Opelous is not to make money. Opelous takes 1% of everyone's paycheck. Sounds like communism, right? Redistribution. <laughs> Opelous takes 1% of everyone's paycheck to fund the operations of the commons. The commons is very inexpensive to run, and there's like 95% margin. So at scale, I think it'll be about 4,000. Some people on our team think it'll be 10,000. Somewhere between four and 10,000 members, right now we're at about 500, there will be profits. It will print cash because 1% of, right now it's like 60 million a year. At the end of the year, it'll be close to 100 million a year. And then 
What's the tax from that? A billion? Yeah. Another year from now? But it still only costs the same amount to run the cooperative. Maybe a little bit more for marketing, a little bit more for membership stewards to process and do like membership relations and retention and whatever. But it's, it's not gonna be that much more expensive. And so where does that money go? Into my pocket. <laughs> it's all in my pocket. <laughs> no, it's a cooperative. It goes as a cash dividend back to the members who hold on to their work token. So there's the, there's the reason, like the why. So right now, so there's no cash dividend, there's no reason to hold on to the work token. You're just kind of leaving it there. I haven't claimed mine in a while because I don't, I don't want to get into tax and accounting advice, but like theoretically, when you claim a distribution or an airdrop or whatever, that becomes the taxable event. If you leave it there, you don't touch it. It's not yet taxable. Theoretically, I'm not a CPA or a lawyer, so that was, that was not tax advice. <laughs> Theoretically, I mean, nobody really knows what the guidance is because the IRS has changed their mind a few times. We're all just trying our best, right? You just leave it there until you want it and you claim it. Um, the point being, you can claim it, you stake it, and then when there are profits to distribute, it'll be distributed pro rata based off of your staked work. That's a good question. No more questions. Is it inflationary or do you guys have a supply cap? It is incredibly inflationary. <laughs> Let me explain. Okay, so inflationary models typically, especially in DeFi, are time-based, <clears throat> right? So we're gonna take X amount of tokens, we'll put it into a farm, it'll go for three months, and then we'll mint more, right? And more will just keep getting minted. So Opal's inflationary model is not based on time, it's based on growth. So when we grow by 10% in payroll volume, so let's say we run a million dollars in payroll, and then the next month we run 1.1 million in payroll, that would be 10% growth, at which point 5 million work tokens would be minted. If we don't grow by 10%, no tokens get minted. So we're all sitting around going, where are my tokens, right? Well, we didn't grow. So it incentivizes the members to continue running their payroll, to continue paying themselves more if they can, referring their friends so that we can continue growing. It's not a zero sum game, right? So in DeFi, how many of you participate in like DeFi summer or have ever done any like yield farming or whatever? All right, influencers will go into these farms, they'll, they'll farm for like 48 hours and then they fuck off and dump the token. There's my third, sorry. All right, we got an R rating here. And then, then they jump on retail and they're like, oh, I was just in this great farm. Starts to pump, then they sell, right? The positive sum aspect of this is it's pro rata, but it's only pro rata if we continue growing. So if we don't grow, there's no new tokens. So we have to work together to continue growing the commons. Why? Like, what is, what is the why? Because we work in a subjugated manner for employers, right? Employers own our healthcare, our dental, our vision, whatever. So the question that I asked for the beginning was, like, who has not left their job for fear of losing their, their health insurance benefits? This is a game that is played by HR departments to try to incentivize and over time, fringe benefits have gone lower and lower and lower. Like, the last 20 years, pensions have evaporated. Um, I don't want to list all of them. A lot of the benefits, I mean, you guys see it. Like, you're, the companies are putting out less and less. There's no reason to be loyal to a company. Like, my boomer parents are like, what do you mean you're leaving your job? You've only been there two years. I went through that like eight times. <laughs> not eight times. I'm not that old. Like, four times. But like, our generation, like, how many of you have had the same job since college? Are you still in college? Is that what? Okay. One. Wait, after college, same job. Yeah. Yeah. Only one? Yeah. I have two friends. That one, because the second one just left. One person. <laughs> one person who has had the same job since college, right? It's just not a thing anymore. You don't go to the Ford factory for 30 years and then retire with a fat pension. Those don't exist anymore. So the loyalty component is gone. You're responsible for paying your bills and like collecting savings and, and figuring out how to, how to 
bill clients and okay if i said x is not sufficiently decentralized what comes to your mind first banks all right banks are not sufficiently decentralized government government's not sufficiently decentralized data really no one's gonna say solana for real oh. <laughs> Do you guys all work at, in, in the ecosystem? <laughs> it's a lot of beaches. <laughs> <laughs> jokes, jokes. Polygon. Sure, Polygon. Yeah, there are lots of, lots of things that, you know, we don't have to get into the micro of like <laughs> trade-offs of security versus scalability, yada, yada, yada. There are people who will say X is not sufficiently decentralized. And maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but it's a trade-off and there are other values and Whatever, that was, it was a joke. <laughs> you guys like really like, climbed up. <laughs> yes? So Aquas pays payroll. Yes. Is it only in USD? Mm, kind, no. <laughs> All right, here's the, the reason for the kind of. So you can fund your paycheck with stable coins or cash. The easier one is cash because you just ACH it from your bank account. You use stable coins, you have to log in twice a month. Really difficult stuff, right? Because it's crypto, we can't just take the money out of your account. You have to sign a transaction authoring it, authorizing it to send us whatever it is that your paycheck amount is. And then on the receiving side, you have to legally receive minimum wage in US dollars. This is a old law to protect like migrant workers and like farmers from being paid in like hamburgers. <laughs> like far, like this is this is real. Yeah. Um, the Department of Labor, FLSA, like farmers would literally pay their, their hands in like you can sleep here and we'll give you lunch. And like that was how people got paid, right? And so Long story short, the Department of Labor considers USDC to be hamburgers. So <laughs> it's a, it's a commodity. They don't consider it to be current. They don't consider it to be a currency. So minimum wage you have to take in U.S. dollars, which in, in California is like sixty-five thousand. But anything above sixty-five k. So let's say your salary is one hundred thirty k. You can take half of your paycheck in cash, half of it in stable coins. Tell like, who? Like, pay, like, the government. So as long as, like, all the benefits are paid in USD, yeah. you pay out the net total in crypto and just say that you're right, cutting a check. That sounds like fraud. <laughs> <laughs> we try not to lie to the government. There's, all right, so are you guys familiar with Al Capone? And it was more famous than San Francisco. I get paid completely in Bitcoin. That's reasonable. And I do the payroll. Okay. And so, yeah. Oh. I, okay. But you're, you're not a W-2 employee. I am. I am also a 1099. Um, but you're 1099. But I, for my main job, I'm a 1099. And your W-2, we probably shouldn't have this conversation on camera. <laughs> but like, <laughs> don't say your employer's name is, because the IRS is listening. Um, <laughs> The, what, what I do, uh, I use Juno. I don't know if you guys use Juno or heard of Juno Finance, um, but they allow me to transfer money from USD to USDC for free. So what I do is I'll take my paycheck in USD, I'll swap it for USD, send it to like MetaMask or something, and then, and then put it into like real money and not stable coins. Because um, I'm a DGEN, I can't hold stable coins for the sake of my life. Um, but the, the, the end of the, the punchline of the thing that we were just asking about, about sufficiently decentralized, um, no, you, 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 are not sufficiently decentralized. If you have one source of income, you are, you're not sufficiently decentralized because you are at the, the beck and call or the, the subjugation of whoever signing your paycheck, right? And you're like, you've got, you've got a mortgage, you've got rent, you've got credit card bills, you're like, whatever. And you want to leave your job, but you can't because you're stuck. If you're in crypto, you're probably not, I don't want to make assumptions, but probably not like paycheck to paycheck and like stuck, especially if you're out on a Wednesday night, right? You know, on the second job that you're blown off to be here. If you are blown off your second job to be here, I appreciate it. Um, but it's, it's, not, it's not particularly likely. 
It's Tuesday? <laughs> did, your, did your second job on Wednesday and not Tuesday? <laughs> and thank you for the correction, I appreciate it. Um, so what we're trying to do is make it so that you can sufficiently decentralize yourself. So instead of having one W2 job where you're just stuck, you own your own employment, right? So you're able to do the thing, you process the payroll, you get our benefits, whatever, but you're still in control of all that. Like we're not telling you who to work for, we're not telling you how much to pay yourself above the IRS telling you you have to pay yourself minimum wage. And you can then take that, those rails, and you can say, all right, I'm gonna work here 10 hours, I'm gonna work here 20 hours, whatever. And you're gonna go out and get your own contracts. And it, well, one, it makes hiring and firing much easier for you and for HR departments because they're like, all right, well, Web3 is about goals-oriented development and not time. Do any of you have to sign a, do any of you in Web3 have to sign time cards? Do any of you have time cards? Nice. My mom has a time card and like literally has to clock out to go to the bathroom. It's ridiculous. Yeah, this is boomers. This is how they live. Clocking out to go to the bathroom? Fuck off. I'm gonna poo on company time. <laughs> That's not my force. Like, <laughs> <first word>. <laughs> We're getting into X territory now. Um, yeah, so you should sufficiently decentralize yourself and open yourself up to this this world of possibilities where you're able to contract from multiple different organizations. You've got different streams of payroll coming from different parts of your your life. Maybe you're you're doing, you know, your Uber driving, like I was, in addition to whatever it is you're doing elsewhere. And when one of your contracts gets, gets, it disappears, right? You have a network of, it's like this, um, it's like a cyclical internal, like being a positive contributor to the ecosystem, many ecosystems, because you know that at some point one of your contracts is gonna end and you're gonna rely on this network to help find you more work. And by having multiple irons in the fire all the time, these opportunities are gonna become more abundant and they're gonna, they're gonna appear more often, which is like a full circle, beautiful way of just all of us being global nomads and not being tied to whatever. The, the grand vision for Opolis is a global public utility infrastructure for employment. And we, we, based off of what you report to us, we can pay your correct taxes in whatever jurisdiction you're in, right? So you're in San Diego now, and let's say like you want to spend a few months in New York, which like maybe don't tell because the taxes are higher there. I'm just kidding, pay your taxes. <laughs> New York, like Florida, Texas, whatever, you can travel the world, and like as long as you tell us what the address that you're staying at, we'll pay the right taxes to the right jurisdiction and the right amounts. And like this is going to infinitely free the the entire world. That's that's like the grand I'm not gonna break the mic, but that's like that's the mic drop thing that we're trying to accomplish. Okay, right? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna... Yeah. yeah. Do the Opulus, Opulus uh, dividends get paid in work or in stable coins? It'll... So, we don't have any yet because we don't have profits to distribute. When we do, it'll very likely be in stable coins. Stable coins are cash, but it'll probably be stable coins. What are the difficulties of like expanding multinational? Like, oh man. Huge, right? Okay, number one, right up top, French fucking labor law. <laughs> <laughs> There's my fifth. Um, <laughs> they're like Euro European labor laws are really strict and they are worker protections, the irony of which making it more difficult for us to give workers better benefits. Um, the concept of co-employment that we do, so when you join the Opolis Employment Commons, we're co-employing you with your LLC, right? We take over EOR, which is employer of record. That co-employment infrastructure doesn't exist in most countries. Like that's just not a concept. Um, crypto money transmitter things for other countries, we haven't had a problem so we're US, and then we just expanded to Canada, um, Ontario and British Columbia, probably never Quebec because of French labor laws. 
That was, that was a joke. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> Do you guys not know about Quebec? It's like a different Canada. It's like not Canada, Canada. But they would say they're the only Canada, Canada, and the other one's not real Canada, Canada. <laughs> it's like Texas of Canada? Is it? Yes, it's the Texas of Canada. <laughs> it's like the California of Canada. <laughs> yes, the California and or Texas of Canada. Um, this is the only two that we've tried. Uh, I know that we, we hired a lawyer in Germany and we struggled a little bit with the non-existence of co-employment and also they don't use payroll companies the same way. I'll give you an example. So when you hire a German or a French person, like you're basically committing, it's like marriage. It's, it's literally like a marriage contract. You're stuck with them until they retire and then you're paying off their pension, right? It's, it's like not at all the way we imagine life. <laughs> <laughs> It's a different existence. And like, they seem to like it, so to each their own. I'm not gonna say you're doing it wrong, but it makes it much more restrictive. Like, in a lot of crypto circles, it's like, don't hire French people. Don't direct hire French people. There's a lot of French stuff in crypto, but they're all self-employed, they're all working on their own. Because you can't direct hire a French person because of these labor laws. There's nothing wrong with French people. The French government's the problem. Is there a way to get around that? Or is it just stuck in there? So if I had my way, yeah, we would be all the way. So I worked at Lyft, which is the opposite of Uber. So Lyft is like, <laughs> but like the secret is that they're the same company. It's like the same, like VCs, like same portfolio. Like they're, they're like the same company, right? It's like, it's like um, Seattle's Best and Starbucks. It's the same company. And like between them is like 70% market share. Okay, all right, so like Lyft's thing was like go slow and fight for market share after Uber has broken all the rules and gotten its wrist slapped and fined. And like they would follow them into markets and like Lyft is like barely expanding into Canada. So they were basically like Lyft, we, US and Canada. Whereas Uber was like, they're everywhere and it's like, all right, so who went to DEF CON in Bogota? You used Uber? Yeah. You know Uber's illegal in Colombia? And like, I, I, so I was listening to this story, the last time I was in Colombia, and this guy, uh, he was saying, Uber drivers have to be very careful because when they come to taxis, taxis will like block them in on these one-way streets, beat them up, call the cops, and then the Uber driver gets arrested. And like, the Uber's like, 100% in Colombia. They're like, yep, we're alive in Colombia, we do the Colombia thing. They're just everywhere. Right, so I, I think the, the the way around it is just like fuck local governments. There's six, yeah, yeah. yeah, YOLO. But I'm not in charge, so that's not the the direction that we're. <laughs> no, our, our no, we, we have a very risk averse uh, COO who helps keep me out of jail. So. Yeah. Hey, um, so is Oculus. Primarily directed at Web3 developers, or do you have plans to expand out into the 1099 That is a great question. Uh, the question was Is Opolis Web3 focused, or do we have all 1099? Whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, good restating? Okay. It is not Web3 focused. Anybody with a 1099 asterisk can join. We just so happen to be very involved in the Web3 space by nature of our CEO, or Chief Executive Steward, John Paller and founder, being the ETH Denver founder. So like, there's a lot of cross-pollination. Like, I mean, we, we have like 120 to 200 sponsors every year. So like, we're very connected with a lot of Web3 companies, and Web3 companies don't want to hire, direct hire US employees. And so we're able to, like, so for example, Shapeshift, um, Air Force, actually visionary. Uh, they dissolved their company and created Shapeshift DAO, and then what do the employees of Shapeshift DAO do? I think we, we onboarded like 60 or 70 of them, and they are, yeah, they all run their payroll through us, and they're not, they're all self, self sovereign employees. It's a great example of like leading and following by your own values. Um, however, and the important end of this question, 
is, and I'll explain the asterisk in a second, it's Web2 and Web, like there we have real estate agents and lawyers and doctors and whatever who don't touch crypto at all. This is gonna be great in a few years because they don't care about the work token. They literally, they ACH money from their business account into their personal account and like four or five years from now, they're gonna be like, hey, this crypto thing is finally caught on. I don't know if it's four or five years. Maybe 10, whatever. You guys are supposed to give me pushback and be like, no, next year we're going mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> we're a passive audience yet. Dead okay. hmm? We're dead inside. Yeah, we're dead inside. <laughs> it's been a long summer. It has been a very long summer. <laughs> but there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel, right? Not the dead kind, like the we're going through this. <laughs> Different kind of bright light. Um, all right, train of thought, where were we? Oh, doctors, lawyers, where? And they're gonna, like in a few years, they're gonna be like, hey, wasn't I earning crypto this whole time? And then they just have a pile of work tokens. I'm really looking forward to that. We have some real estate agents who actually take partial paycheck in Bitcoin, that's kind of cool. Um, anything above minimum wage can be taken in, in crypto. Um, the asterisk, is that what you're gonna ask? The asterisk is, we're only able to take admin codes that are like, I describe this, this is not the PC way to describe it, but I describe it as desk jockeys and keyboard warriors. So if you are a desk jockey or keyboard warrior, you are welcome. If you are a truck driver transporting nuclear waste, I'm sorry, I can't help you. <laughs> if there's different like administrative codes for workers' compensation that like, some are significantly more expensive policies, and generally, everyone who's in this room will fit inside of that one neat desk jockey and or keyboard warrior. Mm -hmm. So if I'm a gig content developer, sure. for example, is that a desk jockey? Yes. Oh, okay, the, the caveat there is if, let's say you are um, using like a platform like OnlyFans, and you are... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Let's say, well, you're talking about content creation. So, um, if you are a solo artist, yes, that is still desk jockey, keyboard warrior. Um, if you are performing with a partner, uh, that is not covered under the, the workers' compensation codes. Yeah, sure. About taxes. Do you guys have a tax service that helps your Man, I wish. The question was, do we have a tax service that helps with our uh, independent contractors? This is like the most demanded thing we, we have. Um, we have hired a few internal CPAs. We're trying to figure out the best way to service like 500 members, and like CPAs don't usually have that capacity. And we don't want to use a firm because we want to use independent CPAs, so if you, know a solo CPA who would like to join and service the commons, um, I have somewhere between two and three hundred clients <laughs> ready for them. That's like a job in itself. Yes. Are you a CPA? No, I'm not. not you got one now. I got one. Nice. I knew it was a good thing to come here. <laughs> Did you guys eat all the pizza? <laughs> Did you even save me a slice? I'm just kidding, I ate it before you got here. <laughs> so one of the cool things we're adding to Eat Denver this year, the thing I'm most excited about, we're adding a comedy hour. So I'm gonna try to tell my Web3 jokes on stage and get booed. <laughs> <laughs> Test one out. <laughs> that, that was... <laughs> I can tell you the other half of the, um, the like Wimbledon, like Eat Denver, being the Wimbledon, or as I'm gonna ask, right? That's the first part. Like the French Open is, I'm gonna tell my seventh F word here, right? So the the French Open is ECC, uh, you know, obvious reasons, it's, it's French, right? And then MCON is the New York, the US Open, because it's not particularly, it's not as high attended, it's a smaller cohort of people. Um, it's, it's important, like the best play, but it's not, you know? It's not the most important one out there. And then DevCon is the Australian Open because no matter where in the world it is, like 98% of the attendees have to fly really fucking far to get there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. One person left, it counts. I have to fly far for DevCon, so. 
I also had to fly. Actually, not that far. For that it was like four hours for me. Help me understand why it's so hard for you to find these crypto tax people. Because there's only a handful of crypto-specific tax software platforms, yeah. and they each have their own marketplace of independent tax people that use yeah. that platform. So, like, they're all in-house. And also, none of those services have decent or at any APIs, so we can't connect to them. We do get we like ten percent off at token tax, but like also of the crypto tax preparation softwares, like none of them can actually keep up with crypto. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like, this is a fake story, IRS. Okay, <laughs> like I, I put all my transactions. This is DeFi summer twenty twenty. I put all my transactions in the coin tracker, and like, I did okay during DeFi summer, right? And it told me my entire tax liability was like four thousand dollars. I'm like, okay, there's something wrong here. <laughs> but like, I'm not going to try to go look for the problem. <laughs> I use the tax software. I put all my transactions in there. I did my best. <laughs> I'm not a tax professional, right? How, how am I supposed to spend like hours and hours and hours trying to figure it out? Like, it doesn't understand NFTs. It doesn't understand cost bases of ETH in the NFTs. It doesn't understand liquidity pools doesn't understand yield farms. There's so many different things and aspects of what we do in DeFi that these softwares just like don't get. And it's like, all right, you, you deposit in a, if all of you use Aave, or are familiar with Aave and Compound, you deposit ETH into Aave, and what do you get in return? Aave. Yeah, 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 it's like AWEF or whatever, right? It's like you, you sold ETH for AWEF. And it's like, no, I didn't. That's a receipt on my deposit. And token tax is like, that's not how we see it. It's like, I'm not going to use you. So. That, uh, also, like, liquidity pool. I was trying to explain liquidity pools to my, to my um, oh, he actually lives not far from here. My CPA. He's been my family CPA since before I was born. Um, he lives in some town north of here. I can't remember the name right now. It's No, no, it's near my pillow, though. It's east of that. Solana Beach. He doesn't mean so much. Some sort of ethnicity. Ah, nice. Do you know him? His name's Tom. <laughs> Don't tell him I told this story. He definitely is not on Twitch, so I can tell the story. So I was trying to explain to him what liquidity pools were, and he's just like, he's a, he's a little older, right? But he still, he does Coinbase stuff. And so he does, he does, um, like basic Bitcoin and ETH transactions. He's like, I understand this stuff because I can do, you know, a sex export, right? The, he didn't say sex, I'm saying sex. The CEX, for those of you who don't crypto, CEX, centralized exchange. Um, and I was like, all right, so it'd be like if you took 10 shares of Microsoft and 15 shares of Apple and put them in a pool together, he's like, whoa, whoa, whoa what do you mean? I'm like, no, that, hang, hang, hang in there. Wait with me. Each of these is worth $500. I don't know the market value though, so whatever. Just let me have it. It's worth each one of those is worth $500. One of them goes up by a couple bucks. One goes down by a couple bucks. Now I'm not going to be pulling out 10 and 15. It'll be like seven and a half and 18. Whatever. He's like, well, but that's not wait, what. <laughs> I'm sorry, like, I, I tried my best. $4,000 of liability, that's fine. <laughs> it's gonna be rough. So, that, I, like, the best, the, the um, not advice, but like, the common consensus right now is that, like, the IRS is just gonna kind of forgive some of the messier things. Like, if you tried your best to like report what you were supposed to report and you made a good faith effort to pay it, like they're not gonna penalize you for making mistakes. They may ask you for more money if you did make a significant mistake, but you're not gonna get penalized. You're gonna see jail time. Taxes is, and there's like another example, but taxes is like the big example of if you try your best and still break the law, you don't go to jail for it. So my financial advice, <laughs> do your best to pay your taxes to the best of your ability. Oh, nice. We got back to the joke. In my train of thought, without having you guys help me recall, are you guys familiar with Al Capone? <laughs> Full circle. We got that. 
Amazing. No, you're good. That's fine. So um, Al Capone, I'm from Chicago, so he's like my favorite person ever. He, you know, okay, Al Capone, you know he's responsible for there being expiration dates on milk? I bet you didn't know that. You're welcome, Al Capone. Or, thank you, Al Capone. Okay. He's theoretically responsible for a body count of over 400. Not sex, like kill them. <laughs> he, uh, so, yeah, uh, theoretically killed over 400 people, uh, racketeering, selling alcohol during the prohibition, uh, lots of, I don't know, terrible things, right? And what did he go to jail for? Tax evasion. Tax evasion, tax evasion, exactly. Because the government doesn't care about any of the other laws. Go fucking kill people. <laughs> but pay your taxes. <laughs> I was trying my material. That was a joke. Don't, don't kill anyone. <laughs> oh yeah, but Xerox Joshua, the eat this so I could kill someone. <laughs> <laughs> don't be that guy. Or girl. Is this right? Women can be murderers too. <laughs> but yeah, okay, there's three. You were in the front row, sorry. <laughs> also, you get your paycheck in Bitcoin, so like, <laughs> libertarians live by a different code. <laughs> I'm gonna put you in the front seat, the front row at my comedy specials. <laughs> He's laughing at everything. Chris, <laughs> Chris needed you to get to mine so you could give these laughs back. <laughs> all right, I will give them back. Did you have a question? I have an LLC, but I've never used it. I don't even know why I'm paying for it. I just have one. Can I join? Yes. Okay. I need to use Almost. There's like one step left. Okay. So a vanilla LLC, or just an LLC, is not eligible to join. Does anybody have an idea why? It's not yet an escort? Yes, but why? I'll answer that question. There's no payroll, huh? Yeah, so an LLC is considered a pass-through, right? So any money that an LLC earns, if you're the sole owner of the LLC, uh, is just your personal income. It's, called, it's considered a disregarded entity. So what we do is undisregard the entity and make it so that it is something that can earn money, so that your LLC is gonna earn your money from your clients, right, your invoices, and then what we're gonna do is invoice your LLC, which is an expenditure. So let's say your clients are paying you 100K, right? 100K is going into the LLC that elects S Corp or C Corp or B Corp, although it's probably an S Corp, right? And then we invoice your S Corp for $100,000. Now your S Corp has 100K in, 100K out, no tax liability. You do still have to file, which depending on how much of a jerk your CPA is, somewhere between $100 and $250. If it's more than that, you probably should get a different CPA. It's not hard to do a books on 100 in, 100 out, right? That's pretty straightforward. Um, and then, this isn't part of the answer, but it's part of how I usually talk about this in this sentence. Um, on the this column, the W-2 side, uh, you just take in the W-2 that you get from the commons, and then you hand that over to, uh, to your CPA. Makes things real easy. Yeah, so we need it to not be a disregard any. So um, your LLC is eligible to elect S-Corp on January 1st. So you, you can do that, you can join. Cool, I'll do some homework. Beginning of the year, this is a great time to reevaluate your finances. <laughs> you look like you have a question. No, I'm just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot, are there any lawyers in here? No lawyers, interesting. Do all the lawyers, in, do they all live in LA? Is that the... <laughs> Mm -hmm. One left. One left? Okay. I knew it. I saw it in your eyes. <laughs> so I have two businesses. One's treated as a sole proprietorship and the other is an LLC. Okay. Which can both join under... So the sole proprietorship is not like a... That has to be an LLC, right? No, no, no. So you only join once. Like you get one employment vehicle. So theoretically, so that his question, he says he's got a sole proprietorship and an LLC, both that are making income. How does he join the commons? So what I would do in that situation is I would spin up a th either a third entity or I would have the sole proprietorship paying to the LLC. And the third entity would be your employment vehicle that's drawing from both of those different income streams and then 
just, I don't know, resolving is the best word, settling in the employment vehicle and then using that as your, to run your payroll. Okay, I give work to anybody who comes to a, a thing that I go to. So, do these guys have your ETH address? I signed up on Lingo, which they all should have, so yes. Nice. Hopefully it is a Polygon eligible address. I don't know the best way to phrase that, but like if you use Coinbase, I don't know what you're doing. Because <laughs> the work token is on Polygon, and if I send it to an exchange address, you're, you're just nuking it. So, it has happened before, so I have to bring it up. And then we have to figure out who's going to get that buff coin. <laughs> I guess maybe we've got to throw everyone in the raffle. Uh, yeah, did the pullout come in yet? Oh, no. Damn. There, there is a pullout for this evening, and you will get one. You just don't have the gratification of like scanning my phone to get it. It'll just have to be emailed to you. Boo you. This is entirely our fault for thinking about it last minute. So yeah, you can, you can boo me, that's fine. I thought about it like two hours ago. I, for, I forgot to, to issue a pro app. I usually issue pro apps for things that I go to. You got the pen, so. I do. Yeah, I do have this pen. And Patricio is gonna, he's gonna send me a message and be like, why was the camera on your right side? <laughs> Nobody on the Twitch screen can see the poet. Are you going to come back the POAP crawl 2023? Yes. When is the POAP crawl? What is it? Yes. And each, is it here? Each crypto meetup group in San Diego picks a bar. We crawl and get a POAP at every bar. When is that? We just had one this past July. It was our first So one. next July. That's right. Did you guys all go? How many of you have at least one POA? Okay, those of you who didn't raise your hand, I'm curious. Why don't you have a POA? <laughs> you don't know what it is? I don't know what that is. Don't know what it is. Never been to an event that Never been to an event that Well, this one has one, kind of. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> OF stands for, uh, does, does anyone know what it stands for? Yeah, proof of attendance protocol. It's the, the bookmarks of your life on chain. It's really cool. It's like digital stickers. Yeah. My my first poet. Do you guys all remember your first poet? How do you not remember your first poet? It's like my first was a DevCon five, and then my second poet was a uh, uh, Eat Ever Volunteer. You have a curious song about what your first poet is. Doesn't even know what his first poet is. You know that meme, like, the, do you even lift, bro? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a Gitcoin pull app? There are, yeah. yeah I, think there are the, first ones. I think some of the kudos were PO apps. Oh, yeah, yeah. Kudos were cool things you could earn back in the day for doing things on chat. And that's for Gitcoin. Who, raise your hand if you have contributed to a Gitcoin CLR round. So, That's not a lot of people. Grant. Huh? We had a grant that was funded by some, some awesome members in our community, but, yeah. Sweet. We saw it. It's not by all of the community, it would seem, by the number of hands that didn't go up. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a gradual increase. We'll get there. Gitcoin is great. And it is very important that you give at least one dollar to things like, <laughs> like this because of the way quadratic voting works. <laughs> So to help improve the funding that ETH SD gets to host wonderful events like this and pay for pizza. I, I was gonna say the name, but I don't wanna give them a shout out. <laughs> uh, to pay pizza and beer and whatever. The more individuals who vote for a thing, the more funding it gets from the matching pool. So like, I could give $100 to ETH SD and it would draw like maybe $15 from the matching pool. But what would be significantly more substantial is if 30 people gave $1 and you'd end up getting way more than $15 from the matching pool. That's how quadratic voting works. So, yeah. Yes, so in December when they do the next grant round, find it in your heart to give one whole die. <laughs> A die is worth $1, if, for those who didn't know that. 
Okay. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Thank you, If you guys haven't heard, we're hosting a Ethereum bootcamp here, right here. Woo! These desks could be yours yeah. in January. Uh, we're partnering with Alchemy to do this. So if you guys haven't signed up and you're interested in becoming an Ethereum developer, sign up now. Um, I should have probably posted this, but it's all over Discord and Twitter. Um, so yeah, and if you have questions, just come and talk to me, Chase, or Nerd. Um, we can help you out. If you're not on the Discord yet, what are you doing? Oh yeah, if you're not on the Discord, go see Nerd to help you out more. You'll get a locals tag too, which is cool. It's exclusive. You get updates and I don't know other cool things, right? Co ops. Utilities coming. Utilities coming. Second, uh, we've got a meetup uh, on December fifteenth with Kevin Jones. He's from Build Guild. So um, if nice. you want to learn uh, about Scaffold ETH, if you're getting into development, you want to learn how to get started building DApps, that'll be a really great workshop. Um, highly recommend that. Kevin talks at a lot of the ETH global events, and he's like all over the place. Um, and then Build Guild is part of, uh, what is it? It's Austin Griffith's uh, DAO, right, I believe. Um, and they do a bunch of cool stuff for devs. Uh, so and that's actually, December 15th. And they helped us with the, um, the ETH that we're staking out, and they're also helping us with the Buffcorn trade swapper. Nice, so. the trade swapper. I'm really excited for that. We didn't talk about that. I know, maybe we'll talk about that when we do the raffle. So whoever gets the Buffcorn will good. know about the trade swaps. Um, Okay, third, uh, a big shout out to this space. So if you guys don't know, this is, this is the ETHSC Clubhouse and it lives within a bigger co-working space. Um, and we're calling this bigger co-working space the Web3 co-work space for lack of a better name. But if you guys are interested in co-working here, we're giving uh, discounts to every ETHSD member. Um, there's a much bigger space that you guys don't see out there. There's desks, there's conference rooms, uh, there's cubicles. So if you guys are interested in co-working here, also come find me. We'll post more information about that. Um, and last but, last, last but not least, wow, um, we've got a podcast, the EFSD podcast, uh, and our first guest was uh, Zero X Joshua. That was our so, first one. That was the first one, like the first official one, yeah. He's a great um, host. I can't believe that was his first one. We got practice with Twitter spaces, thankfully. Um, but yeah, so uh, a lot of great news. Uh, let's give Zero X Joshua one more round of applause, and then we'll do a round of something, buffaloes and unicorns had a war and then fucked, and then now we have buffalo horns. That's the, I don't, the lore doesn't pretend, it's fine. Um, <laughs> they're like, the civil war, like, I don't know, it, it, they ended it by like, some sort of feudal swap of, buffalo horns are um, the magic of the unicorn, the strength of the buffalo, Oh, just like, oh. Yeah. 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 Um, we can do. Yeah. 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 Uh, Chester and yeah. Sanera also. Yeah. Chester and the girls? Sanera, X A N E R A. Before I flip the switch, I'm going to continue to yeah. more. X A N E R A. X A N E R A. Okay. Cool. Okay, the magic of the unicorn, strength of the buffalo. Uh, 2018, a Colombian artist, Sergio, did a magnificent job. And then uh, 2021, this is the, not to like 
I don't want to front run information we talked about on the podcast, so I'm not going to go deep into that. But um, we did a PFP in, in uh, November 2021 with a lead up to try to do like an exclusive lounge and other benefits at East Denver. And part of the roadmap that we announced would we do trade swapping. Because the idea is not to have like just some bullshit thing that you would try to speculate on and flip, right? The goal is for you to have one buff corn, like you can have others if you want, but one buff corn that is that's you. That's your identity, right? The so it's not on the screen anymore, but the one up there before that was my buff corn. I like to scuba dive. I have a 30X black Stetson cowboy hat. I live in Texas, it's okay. Rainbow tea. Huh? Rainbow tea. Yeah, rainbow tea. Twenty sided die, which is and a really the most important. Twenty sided die horn for being a, a nerd. OG fur, because um, I was part of the Denver community before the buff coins existed. Um, rainbow hoodie, I could leave your whatever, but and it's holding your mate. It's just a great buff coin. The goal, because when you when you go buy a PFP, it's very likely that the thing that you want, all the things that you want, are not available. And you're like, all right, well, do I just buy a floor one to join the community? Do I spend more than I want to to get the perfect one that has enough trades, maybe one's off? And we didn't want anybody to have to go through that, right? We wanted you to just find one that is close enough to you to, like, to be your identity, right? And then what we can do is have community P, PVP, P with P. <laughs> it's not like against, it's like with, as a community together, like. No trades will be lost or gained. They're exactly the same. So you get to trade with somebody else. Like, so I've got a yearbook hand, and you've got the like the laptop. We can swap. I want the laptop. You want the yearbook hand. So we pay like, a little bit of spork to fuel the algorithm machine thing, and then we can we can swap them. And that way, my buff corn stays my buff corn. But one of the trades changes. There's two traits that will not change. That is your fur and your horn. There's a lot of things you can change about yourself but your fur and your horn, you can't, right? You can change your environment, you can change your workout routine, your food, your clothes, like all the stuff you can change. Your fur and your horn, those are permanent. So what you wanna do, if you are in a market for buff corn, find a fur and a horn that you like, all the rest of it can be swapped out. Now, as we get to this uh, fun thing, um, yeah, I'm gonna pick, uh, I, well, we can, we can work together a little bit to find one from, from, the, uh, from the treasury. That, that kind of vibes with you. We we minted a few too many to the treasury, specifically to like give them out and stuff like this. So I'm gonna pick Bunny. Yeah. Do you want to shuffle the names? Oh, shuffle oh, yeah. the times. Oh, yeah. Let's do it a bunch of times. Okay. Nice. Nice. Wait, wait, you need to shuffle it 52.8 times. Okay. Do you guys know why we do the 5280 mean? I'm gonna say it. Does anyone know? Everything is 5,280. Mile high. Mile high. This isn't based on who checked in? It is. 
no, no, it's uh, people uh, signed up. It's all people in the RSVP for yeah for, for coming. Okay. Wow, see, there's a lesson here. When you RSVP, you should go to a thing. You should my best. Scuba diving? No? What's your thing? Not currently. <laughs> you were aware, but like, I'm not currently. You're certified, you just don't do it. I'm certified. You kind of look like a baseball hat guy. No logos, but yeah. Okay. Nice. What was it? Coffee? Yeah, I don't even have a coffee with you. Yeah, I have your mouth. Yeah, I think I have one of my popcorn. Come up there and get your ETH address. By the way, this is it. I'll come up. I'll come up. Okay. I can tell you. I can see the reason. Well, eventually. But I can see the yeah, see, this is, now we're getting into it now. Yeah, so...